Good morning and welcome. I'm Jonathan Weinhagen, President and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. Thankful to have all of you here for our Public Affairs Forum at the Bloomington Chamber. Want to thank and recognize our sponsor of today's event, XL Energy, so thanks to Michelle and her team. As you know, the Chamber strives to be the voice of business at the Legislature. We are very, very fortunate to have great partnerships in our legislative delegation, and we are joined this morning by two of our Senators, Senator Franzen and Senator Wickland, who will give us a little bit of a recap on the 2017 session and provide a little bit of insight into what happened behind the scenes. With that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Robert Freeman, who is with Health, Health Partners. He is also the chair of our Public Policy Committee. Welcome, Robert. Hey. Thank you, Jonathan, very much. Um, <clears throat> also, thank you again to our sponsors. Uh, please join me in welcoming Senator Melissa Franson and Senator Melissa Wickland. So uh, just quickly, um, thank you so much for being here this morning. Uh, we're having the senators, uh, Sen Senate delegation for Bloomington, come here and do the wrap up in, in the uh, winter. You may remember we had the House members come in and do the preview. Um, and I'm, my memory is hazy, but I don't think the preview is going to be exactly the same as the final recap. <laughs> so <clears throat> we were full of optimism and, and hope in the beginning, and I don't know where we are now. So um, if, uh, I'm going to ask Senator Franz and Senator Wickland maybe just to s both start um, by just maybe taking a couple of minutes to talk about, um, just introduce themselves. Uh, their bios are on the table here, so I'm not going to read through those, but just to, take, to introduce themselves, to talk about how they think session went kind of at a high level, and maybe talk about one or two things that they worked on this session um, and what happened with those. So let's start with Senator Franzen, because she's nearest. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, quite frankly, I think we're still recovering from uh, this legislative session, particularly last week. So um, I brought my cheat sheet because a lot of the bills, as you know, uh, were negotiated into the very last and, and overtime as well. So we were um, put back into se a special session at 7.01 uh, on Monday morning. Uh, and it was pretty brutal, I have to say, but, uh, but we survived and love to have a little discussion about uh, insights on that. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I, this is my second term in representing Senate District 49, which is the communities of Edina, West Bloomington, portions of Eden Prairie, Minnetonka. And I currently serve on the committees of taxes and on, uh, uh, I'm blanking now too on my committees, but I used to be on, on education and I used to be on transportation, public safety. I'm still on transportation, public safety and taxes. And I used to be on uh, higher education and, and, and HHS, Health and Human Services, my first term. So I only have two committees this term, uh, which were pretty active. Uh, we did pass a, a transportation bill and a tax bill finally this year, and uh, we can talk a little bit about this uh, the, and my votes on, on both of them uh, represent, you know, not necessarily that I'm against some of those uh, policies and those bills, but uh, overall we, we end up voting for a budget for the entire state and all these omnibus bills have things that we like and things that we don't like and we have to make up our mind uh, where we stand at the end of the day to vote either for or against these bills. We don't get a maybe, we don't get a pass. Uh, and it was a, a pretty intense session, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's what we have, divided government, and we, no bill is perfect, and no budget is perfect, and we have to uh, do the best we can for the state of Minnesota, and I think we're in a decent path, uh, but the governor yesterday made some of his uh, uh, decisions of what to sign, what not to sign, and changed his mind on some things last minute, so it's, it's, it's always a, a surprise even for us, but... Uh, be happy to discuss that further and uh, thank you all for being here and being part and engaged on, on making sure that some of these bills actually did come into fruition so thanks to the chamber for, for your efforts on that um, and again uh, my, uh, my thanks as well for coming out today to, to hear from us and uh, my name is Melissa Halverson Wickland and I represent um, the other part of Bloomington uh, kind of western through the eastern border of Bloomington and then I represent north into Richfield um, and uh, a large part of Richfield. So uh, this is also my second term, um, and it was, um, this session was different from all the other ones, and I think every one is different in its own way, but um, this time we started out with a different configuration with uh, both the Senate and the House being controlled by Republican majorities, and so we knew that the that it, there would be some differences from, from previous years that I was in in the legislature. Um, I served on education, um, the E12 Finance Committee, 
and the HHS Finance and Policy Committee, um, and also on local government. Um, all three committees dealt with uh, pretty uh, pressing issues and uh, concerns um, from ranging from school funding and policies within our schools and what policies we want to apply to our school districts um, that they need to follow. Um, to HHS, we dealt with the um, early session discussions about uh, reinsurance and premium relief for consumers um, to try and settle the, the um, health insurance market uh, prior to the 2018 rates coming out. Um, and then later in session, just the, the large HHS omnibus bill, which contains a lot of funding and policy um, that affects uh, most of the uh, health and human services programs. Um, local government, we dealt with a lot of uh, a lot of the issues that you may have heard about, um, having to do with uh, local control um, in terms of the preemption bill, the uh, plastic bag um, control bill, um, the small cell wireless bill, things like that all came through the uh, local government committee. So we had some really um, interesting and uh, good discussions about uh, what does uh, local governments mean uh, within the state. And um, I'd say that the session overall, um, at the end, I think it was kind of a mixed um, mix to me. I uh, didn't support a lot of the, the final uh, budget bills because I felt there were a lot of um, uh, concerns that I had about policy provisions that were within them. Um, but um, that being said, I do think that the for example, education bill that came out with 2% on the formula this year and next year, or this coming year and, and the next, um, is a really good thing um, and is making attempts to get us back to where um, education funding needs to be. So there were um, definitely mixed, um, mixed, I don't know, mixed, a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the process this session, I think we started out with the intention that we would be um, compiling omnibus bills early and there would be ample discussion. Um, as it worked out, they were compiled early and, and, and brought to fruition in, in early April, but um, they weren't really based on a nego true negotiation with the governor and his um, real strong concerns with those bills. So they went to the governor and were vetoed. Um, that really took a significant amount of time away from after that um, period to be able to finalize new bills. And I think that really hurt um, our chances to have a good discussion. So that by the time we got to special session, which as Senator Franzen indicated, started right away, um, really at that point we're just reviewing what um, a select group of people are putting together as the omnibus bill. And in some cases it reflects what was brought forward um, there were many parts of the education bill that were contained within that bill, but there was also a lot of new language. So um, it made us really made it really challenging for us to um, respond, uh, react, and respond, and really have no chance to debate and you know talk through what are the pros and cons of of the things that they wanted to add to those bills. And I think that's unfortunate. I think. Um, I think Minnesotans really want more open discussion and um, more um, thoughtful process in terms of the, the policy decisions. So um, I'll leave it at that and we can talk about um, more specifically what your areas you're interested in. So. All right, well I have a bunch of <coughs> questions that were submitted on cards. I do want to ask a couple of questions first though since you are, have both have some expertise. Um, on some of these, these kind of last minute issues that I think are probably not well understood by the public and we certainly appreciate your take. Appreciate your take. Um, Senator Francis, I'm going to pick on you because you have a law degree. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's okay. Um, <laughs> what is your take on the governor line iteming your salaries for the next four years and how do you think that's going to get resolved? I was surprised just as everybody else that that was done. Uh, I know that uh, we all voted on the constitutional amendment this last uh, election where we took the power away from the legislature to a, a defined group um, outside of the legislature to actually set our salaries because obviously you, you don't want to set your own salary. That seems to be a little conflict of interest there. So we voted on that uh, but at the same time um, 
you know, now those salaries are put into question. Um, some people say, oh, the public didn't know what they voted for. I, I really um, question that. I, I think we are, we're a very, very educated state, and we <laughs> knew that we wanted to take the power away from the legislature to set their own salaries. So I, I think the premise of that is, is flawed. And, and I was surprised and, and frankly discouraged because uh, we're just making it more um, harder for people, uh, good people, to come and run for office and, and do the work of the people when we can't even um, agree on, on paying them a decent salary. Um, we're people too. Uh, we have other jobs, as some of us do. Some of people are retired, but a lot of people, this is um, what their income is. So I, I think it's a, I don't know who advised the governor. I'm, I'm not very happy with his decision to line item veto, but I think he's using it as leverage, political leverage, to potentially bring us back. Um, if that's what it takes, um, that's his prerogative. He, he has his own election certificate, but I don't agree with the fact of playing with our salaries, I, I think, and, and the salaries of the legislature, not just us, but our staff. Um, for those of you who do not know, there were people there at the last week of session who were doing 80 hours a week. Um, that is un 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 unconscionable in the public, in the private sector. You would get a lawsuit if you had people um, living at, t at your jobs. Um, so there was people who are very um, qualified, very um, responsible, and um, very much make the process work, who were giving extra time. Some people did not see their families for, oh, for a week. Um, and I'm, 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 it was pretty, pretty brutal if, if you didn't, um, weren't in that environment. And uh, we need to make sure that we also fund our staff who make this process work, who are putting those laws together, and, and who stay there over time while we're at home taking a nap, um, frankly. So I think it's, it's, it's really discouraging that um, he took that approach. But, but again, it's his, uh, his prerogative, and he, I'm sure he has a, an end game with that, too. And <coughs> Senator Wickland, can you explain what happened with the bonding bill in the last night of session and the, the Bloomington, how Bloomington kind of figured into this whole discussion? Um, well. I don't know yeah. if I can really explain it, but I can, <laughs> I can tell you what happened. With, with um, <laughs> the bonding bill, uh, going back to the beginning of session, the, the Senate Capital Investment Committee came out with a bonding bill as kind of a, a talking point. Um, it was m very similar to last year's bill. Um, the House has to actually originate the bonding bill. The Senate can't do that, so this was more for discussion purposes. Um, the House didn't come out with a bonding bill until I think they had one maybe the last week or uh, 10 days before session was over. A it was a very small bill, it was introduced, and they had a session on the floor um, to try and pass it, and they didn't have enough votes to pass it. They didn't have um, any Democrats to vote for it, and bonding bills require a, a, majority, a super majority to pass, so um, they, they need some um, Democrats to support it. So those bills moved through, um, didn't actually come to fruition as far as coming over to the Senate for final passage, but there was continuing discussion about we should have a bonding bill this year. Um, and in special session, uh, that discussion was still active. Uh, the bonding bill, I think, was posted on the 24th, so that would be Wednesday, uh, originally, and then everybody's looking to see what's in it, because it's not the same as what came before. Um, and if I might interject, interject, that's when we saw it as well, yeah. as legislators, that's the first <laughs> I mean, that, time we saw it, that's it's the same time as the public saw it. Right. So it's put online, um, it was placed online. Um, we started going through it and noticed um, that there was a provision in there that affected a, a project of mine, um, which is several years old now, and um, that has to do with the Minnesota Valley uh, State Trail. Um, it's language that I could not support and felt was not uh, brought through any um, process, really. Um, so when you're in special session, you're really working on uh, about six, I don't know, five or six bills at the same time because we're we're trying to analyze all of the special session bills that are that are put forward because we don't know when exactly we're going to have to vote on them. So I went to my leadership to say, you know, this this provision for me for Bloomington is not acceptable to have in there, um, and that was discussed and negotiated and um, brought to the attention of the bonding bill chairs. I brought it to the attention of the bonding wheelchair, um, Senator Senjum, and um, 
I think there was agreement. The governor's office said this isn't acceptable. We don't want this in there. Um, and eventually it came to, to the highest leadership, um, the speaker um, really wanting to keep it in. Uh, but um, at the end, in the end, um, it was used as a bit of a leverage point that <laughs> keeping it in would would have a, uh, an impact on how many votes that you know we would provide in the Senate, and, and we need ne Democrats to vote for bills in the Senate as well, for the bonding bill especially. So um, at that point, um, it was dis decided that it would be removed, and it was removed in the amendment that came out, and we were happy. So I, I was happy at that resolution. Um, certainly, I think things that. There are times that things show up in bills at the last minute, but this was a case of something that had no um, had no bill associated with it. It didn't go through any discussion process in the House or the Senate, and I think that that's not a good time to place things in um, policy language into place when we haven't had that adequate discussion. Does that answer the question? Yeah, <coughs> right on. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right, so I have a bunch of questions here that have been submitted. Um, <coughs> And let's start with the bonding bill because it's a nice, easy one. Um, and uh, why don't we, <coughs> well, either of you can answer this, but I'm guessing maybe we'll stick with Senator Wickland. How will the bonding bill that passed benefit the community? Well, I think um, that's a, a, a great uh, part of the session. I think it's really a positive. Um, two of the projects that will affect Bloomington, uh, the Mall of America Transit Station remodeling uh, was funded at $8.75 million, um, and that is a critical project, I think, for our area to, to help the, the tr busiest transit station in the state become more of a, a reasonable and, and, and a positive <coughs> amenity in the, in the area. Um, it was also really critical because we have um, $7 million of federal funding that's, um, that's been uh, positioned to go towards this project. And that would have been um, lost if we hadn't been successful gaining the state um, state funding this year. Um, that would have run out. So I think it um, it's about a twenty. Um, actually, I'm not sure total now. Uh, twenty million dollar project. There's multiple funding sources: the state, federal, um, metropolitan council. I believe is providing some funding as well, and um, it will now be able to move forward. Um, it had been hoped that we had passed it last year. Uh, we could have possibly had it done before the Super Bowl, but now that won't be possible. But I think uh, given the, the large events that will be coming <coughs> in 2019, uh, the Final Four, I think, and, and beyond, I think having that um, project finished will help Bloomington being, since we're such a um, large hospitality area, a lot, lot of hotel rooms, um, it will be a real benefit for our community. The other project, um, the Orange Line uh, Bus Rapid Transit, was also funded at about $12 million, um, and that is a project that doesn't just affect Bloomington, but I think will help, will benefit Bloomington because we have mm -hmm. um, two, two stops are in Bloomington area, and then uh, Richfield has, um, I think, one or two stop, two stops along 35W. So I think anything to improve the, the transit um, flow through Bloomington will help us um, with, with congestion and, and congestion relief. So those are the two projects that, main projects that will benefit Bloomington. I'll just add um, one of them, and Dr. Joyce Esther had to step out um, from Normandale College. Unfortunately, uh, we did fund HEPER, which is a project for infrastructure uh, projects in, in for um, Minsky and, and higher education, and um, Normandale was actually not included, um, but other other greater Minnesota colleges were. So there's always some some politics within the bonding bill as well, where um, funding um, for you know the majority party can actually include um, things for their members and exclude things that are not necessarily beneficial for their members. So sometimes we lose out, and it's unfortunate because our district we we hardly ever have a lot of ask for the bonding bill because uh, we're well funded. Thankfully, we're in a district which has which has a, a large um, tax base that can can sustain the developments on on our own. So we don't ask for a lot of help. 
from the state government, but we put in a lot of money into the state government. Uh, so, so when we ask something, we really push for it, and we, we, we hope we can, like Ann Lincheski used to say, we should get it because of how much we contribute as tax base to the state government. Uh, but unfortunately, the Heaper um, bill for or the funding for Normandale was not included, so that's something that still will be on the table for uh, the next bonding bill, uh, and we'll keep working on that in particular. All right. <clears throat> Same question, but on taxes, how will the tax bill just pass benefit Bloomington businesses? Well, I, I think, you know, this is my first year on the tax committee, and, and I have a, a steep learning curve, but it's, it's a very important committee to be on because uh, that's the revenue that comes in our state, and, and a lot of big decisions were made this year. We had a huge bonding, uh, this huge tax bill um, that passed and the governor signed. Um, I actually was surprised that he signed it into law because at first he was going to just let it, let it slide and let it become law without his signature. Uh, th in this bill, um, there's a few provisions that I actually worked on, uh, this time as a co-author, the, the Social Security uh, tax tax credit um, now will be able to afford um, credits for, for seniors who are in our district who want to remain here and uh, and certainly um, are paying a, a lot of, of income into into their, from their retirement to Social Security. So that was part of the bill. Uh, we had the general tax levy, which is another provision I supported. Um, and all these um, provisions are, can be scaled. Um, and, and I thought that I ended up not voting for the tax bill. And quite honestly, it's, it's a big item um, ticket for our state. And, and long term, you run a business and you're going to see the long term um, increases and how much it's going to cost um, our state. Um, right now, it's about 600 um, in, in 50 million and change, or some, or between 630 to 660, are the estimates of what the the tax bill would cost million dollars. Um, in the tails, long term, it can go up to 790 million. So it's it's a bigger. It's not just one moment in time, but as as all these um, provisions um, come into effect. The, the, the big the, t the ticket for the entire expense um, becomes larger um, so I thought it was too big but certainly a lot of the provisions in the bill I did support um, like I mentioned the general tax levy um, will, will be now um, afforded to uh, businesses and, and and that would be the first hundred thousand dollars of commercial industrial market value is excluded from the state from the general tax um, levy um, property tax um, so we did that and then it's going to level off eventually um, long term it's going to just uh, re the inflator will be removed which, which which is a big thing that the business community was working for. Uh, the other piece um, that's also related, because we want a, a good workforce, we have 529 plans. Our, there's also a tax credit there for families to, to be able to afford higher education because it's becoming more and more ex expensive. Um, on the higher education bill, we did put a tuition freeze, but unfortunately, we did not fund it. Um, so it's it's kind of, it, 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 it's, it's, it doesn't make sense just to put a tuition freeze and, and not funded because a tuition freeze what it really does is we have to make up that funding that, that the state that the Minsky system and the, the, the U of M system um, was counting on so taxpayers have to pay for that freeze so we put a freeze so um, they can't uh, increase tuition but we didn't fund it so that should be um, interesting that the, the, the U of M and the Minsky system will have to come up with that money somehow so there'll still be some um, impact to to higher education systems uh, we also did federal tax conformity on, on a level of more um, minutia. Um, if you're a tax attorney or in accounting, you probably are interested in all that, and I can give you a rundown of them. But uh, basically, we did the state tax um, conformity from two million to three million. That's another piece uh, that we um, that I supported and worked on. Uh, so overall, um, we're giving um, also um, tax credits uh, for child care tax credits, and um, the working family tax credit was not necessarily included. But there were some other areas where um, Minnesotans will see some tax relief. Uh, it was a, a decent bill. I actually w w would have liked last year's version of the tax bill. It was more modest and, and, and more responsible, but certainly there's uh, things in here that are good. One thing I could not support is the tax cut on tobacco. Uh, and you being in health care, I'm, sure, I'm assuming you probably uh, understand the repercussions of that. Um, we put $40 million uh, to big tobacco, and I find it very ironic that we as a state did that when we are one of the leading um, states in the nation for freedom to marry, where we actually, um, excuse me, freedom to, to breathe, <coughs> um, to actually um, get people healthier. And, and we were leading on that issue, and now we're giving a tax break to big tobacco. I just don't think, I don't know if any of you work in that industry, but I just don't think it's, it's, it's the approach that Minnesota has been leading the path on being a healthy state and one of the best in the country, and now we're, we're going backwards. So um, those are the things kind of on a high level, what were included in the tax bill. And tobacco tax is one of the things that the governor specifically called out mm -hmm. as wanted to come back and work on it as a special mm -hmm. session, correct? Mm -hmm. Um, what 
is the prognosis for Southwest Light Rail after this session? I don't know. Where there's a will, there's a way. I think there's still... Um, is there a will? There, there is a will for a lot of us, especially in, including the governor, and uh, it's not completely... Um, left out. My understanding is the language allows Southwest to come mm -hmm. move forward, but there's some restrictions on future light rail. So it's still, it's still one of those um, hot button issues where people don't um, necessarily, or legislators don't agree uh, the mode of transportation that's more efficient for for our state. I, I frankly um, think we need to be uh, innovative and think of, of not just trains, but whatever the next level of innovation is. So we can't just uh, build roads. There's not enough space for them, and frankly, uh, those cost a lot of money too. And we also subsidize roads uh, as a state so it, it's just interesting how we pick and choose what mode of transportation we want to fund uh, and there's some effort to a lot to um, ask the federal government not to fund light rail for Minnesota as well so I just think that's short-sighted especially as business people we we need more ability to move not just product but um, human humans um, uh, you know back and forth and employees to our efficiently throughout our district and our district would probably um, suffer a lot from it. it it actually impacts our district um, quite a bit um, all the way to Eden Prairie and I, I just can't find a way I, I, I'm not supportive of it at any cost but frankly if we keep playing these political games it really will become unaffordable and then I, I will have to question whether I can support it but I'm still fighting for it and I'll just add a little bit more. I think in the transportation bill, it also, um, the, the funding for transit in general was not sufficient. It, it won't cover what the Metropolitan Council requested. Um, so that means that, you know, more of the cost has to be transferred either to, to the customers um, or um, Metropolitan Council, I guess, can find some other way to manage in the, within their budget. But I think that's um, not the right direction to go. We, um, I think we we know that our, we have constant congestion in our area on 35W 494. Um, just being short-sighted about investing in in transit that can try to get some of the um, some cars off the road, I think is is short-sighted. Um, and I don't think that uh, we are doing uh, poorly in our area as compared to other metro areas in terms of the amount that our fair um, riders support within our transit system so I think that putting even more cost onto them is is not um, not prudent and won't be helpful in in encouraging more people to use transit um, the transportation bill also didn't include uh, very significant funding um, it included about 300 million from the general fund um, about 200 million of that will go towards roads and bridges um, and I think the bottom line for that, for our community, is that, again, um, the 35W-494 interchange is, is just not going to make it um, to the, the go stage of um, being approved. It's, an, you know, the first phase is $85 million, and um, if you only have a pot of, you know, $200 million to work with, I mean, that's just um, going to be really challenging for people to make the decision to fund that project. So. I think that we didn't, um, while uh, it's nice to say that we did pass the transportation bill, I think we had the opportunity to do a lot more and find a, um, another funding stream that could have supported additional transit f money without, or transportation money uh, without using um, as much general fund money or, or balancing that better because um, the general fund is going to be uh, affected by other rising costs in health care and health insurance and um, human services programs, education. Um, and so transportation will have to contend with those larger items. So I think that um, I wish we had found a way to uh, provide another another avenue for funding. And on that note, one one avenue that was discussed was the license tab fees. So when you get your schedule, your depreciation schedule, when you buy a new car, you pay a certain amount um, for your tabs. Um, as the car depreciates, you pay less than that. So there was talk about making that um, schedule um, go slower. So technically speaking, you wouldn't necessarily feel the, 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 the impact financially um, as it opposed to a gas tax. Um, and there was discussion that we would actually put Democratic votes. And I'm trying to be very, uh, this is behind the scenes, um, some of the things that were discussed. Um, but there, there was no appetite in the majority to, to do that because they still saw it as a tax hike. We were trying to be creative and find ways that we can find new, new revenue and dedicated revenue, but nothing was um, 
uh, good enough to be uh, discussed. But that one would have gotten bipartisan support had the majority um, supported it as well. And so that was a, a pretty um, real uh, scenario, but it just didn't make it to the finish line. Thank you. Um, I'm guessing this is from one of our uh, hospitality friends. What is happening with the preempt or what happened with the preemption bill? Do the senators support or oppose these efforts? Uh, well, I can talk about that. Uh, it <coughs> took a uh, full, um, it went through both the House and the Senate as a standalone bill, um, and it came uh, through the Senate floor or came to a committee that I was on, local government, uh, for discussion. Uh, I had real strong concerns about um, taking away the the ability for local governments to to explore and 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 figure out what sort of provisions are best for their communities, um, especially to do it on a statewide basis to say every every city every local government you know um, now is in the position that they can't uh, would take away their ability to negotiate um, uh, agreements or ordinances that had to do with um, wages, um, sick leave. And then it had another um, uh, statement about um, working conditions and um, uh, specific benefits. I don't remember the, the term, but benefits. And it was very open and vague terms that could indicate um, something like um, Bloomington and other cities have put in place um, extensions of the Freedom to Breathe Act to, to include um, e-cigarettes. Um, and they did that in the last few years because as a state we didn't decide to include it in the full um, Clean Air Act, e-cigarettes in the Clean Air Act. So cities like Bloomington have um, taken it upon themselves to explore and decide that they want to include it in their local ordinance. Um, this preemption bill would have affected probably affected things like that as well, working conditions. Uh, there was some small change in the bill um, over time in the Senate to try and maybe mitigate, because that wasn't the initial intent. But it really still, to me, was very vague about what types of things cities would be limited from, from implementing. Uh, so that did pass through the Senate, passed in the House. Um, what ended up happening, the governor uh, at, a, at I don't know, the last week or so a session said that he would not support and would not sign that bill um, and he would veto the bill if it came to him. Um, I think there was more discussion and strategy about well what if we uh, if we put combine um, if we combine some different provisions in the same bill with the preemption bill would he sign that um, and that was what was brought forward in special session. It included um, the preemption language and included uh, the uh, paid sick leave or paid uh, maternity leave, uh, or I shouldn't say maternity, but paid time off for state workers uh, on having a child. Uh, it included pension adjustment adjustments for our state public employees. Um, so they, they combined a number of things that the governor was really supportive of and I would have been supportive of as well with this preemption language. Um, and he continued to say that he would veto it, and, and he did veto that bill. So um, I think we're back to, you know, the, the, there will continue to be discussions, I'm sure, uh, amongst the, the legislature and mm -hmm. business members about, you know, ways to, to accommodate business needs and local government control needs. But that's where, that's where we ended this session. It's what they call the fruit basket, I learned, the, the bill. Um, you like some of it, maybe you like the bananas and, and the strawberries, but you don't like the, the grapes and so forth, so you, you have to vote for the whole thing. Um, so that was what was brought forward, and the governor was very clear that if it included preemption, he was going to veto it, even if it actually hurt some people, which uh, it's unfortunate. Some of those um, employees in the state government were actually on leave and would have to come back if that bill was not passed. So it's unfortunate that, um, that we pit... 
um, people against people, and 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 th these are real these are real hardworking Minnesotans, and it's unfortunate that we play politics with them. So um, I've been very clear that on the preemption bill. I'm a, a small business owner. I've woke, worked for for large corporations. I get what preemption means. I get what these things mean for local governments. But I think it's really um, short-sighted of us to say um, we want local control, local control, local control up up, up until it comes to to paid family leave and and, and the minimum wage. Uh, I think the cities um, are at the best position to decide. They're elected, their, their city councils are elected, just as we are the state level, to really look and see what, what is in the best interest of their communities. And we had plenty of cities that sent resolutions, that passed resolutions against the preemption bill. They said, don't take our local control away. And I think that's um, very indicative of, of where that discussion needs to happen. Um, I have a business in Minneapolis. I know that they're talking about $15 minimum wage, and, and I get the, the repercussions to it. Um, and I will have to either fight or, or support it at the local level because that's, I believe, where it should be. Um, the other thing that the bill included was um, St. Paul and Minneapolis had already had their um, uh, ordinances in place and it would have retroactively um, eliminated um, that um, those provisions from taking effect and I think that's just again um, bad policy when the local government has already decided to pass uh, a freedom to breathe act and extended it to um, e-cigarettes why who are we as a state to tell them otherwise I, I don't believe that's the right um, level of government to be in having that discussion whether I agree with the policy or not I think that discussion ultimately should be at the local level and then us at the local level we have um, uh, we can hold our elected officials accountable. At the state level, um, when we're doing that, um, you know, it, it, the state is very different in greater Minnesota um, to um, Minneapolis, St. Paul. So we have to take that into account. It costs a lot more to live in in, in, in our cities and than, than it would in, in, in greater Minnesota. And there's benefits and, and cons um, for those decisions. So I, I just don't believe um, that should be where we need to be. And frankly, I personally believe that that's, that discussion is happening at the local level at the same time because there is a lack of action uh, of the merits of, of paid family leave and other areas at the state level. So I'd rather have the discussion instead of having preemption, let's just not talk about it, let's just avoid the whole subject um, and, 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 and quash it for, for the time being at the local level. The state should be having a discussion on how do we provide these benefits to all Minnesotans because at the end of the day, we pay for people unemployed. We pay for people who don't have health insurance. We're paying for people who are not able to take leave to take care of their families. I have two young children. It was pretty hard to be, um, I, I had my baby d December 28th. The legislature started the next week. I was at work six days later. Um, we shouldn't, and that was my own decision, but there are people who are realistically having to make that decision to put food on the table, and that shouldn't be the case. People should be bonding with their child. People should be taking care of themselves um, before they, they, you know, they, they, they go back to work, and we just have to figure out what are Minnesota values, and how do we make that happen so that we don't um, really rely on employer-based um, health care, rely, rely on employer-based um, uh, family leave. I think there should be a minimum standard, and we should have that serious discussion at the state level. And if it doesn't pass, it doesn't pass. Maybe in the future it will. But at the end of the day, our state is paying for those decisions that um, that, that that are being picked up because um, some people don't have uh, the privilege to work in a company like a Target, where I did, who offers those benefits. Uh, so I think we should just have that discussion rather than quashing it and preempting it. <coughs> All right. Uh, healthcare. How will the repeal and replace efforts uh, on the ACA that are going on in Congress to repeal or replace Obamacare? How will they affect Minnesota? Well, how do you think they will affect Minnesota? Well, I think from what we know today about proposals, I think the, you know, the big, well, there will be many impacts, I think, on Minnesota. I think the biggest impact that I can see um, is in terms of uh, Medicaid funding, and if, if there are drastic reductions in Medicaid funding from the federal level to the state, um, that will have a really serious impact on, on Minnesotans um, and our state budget if we um, have to start making decisions about um, how to how to keep covering the, the Minnesotans who are covered by Medicaid today and that's you know primarily uh, the elder low-income elderly or poor elderly um, children and uh, people with disabilities um, so I think that uh, should the proposals move forward in the form that they're taking right now um, I think that is going to have uh, well, a serious negative impact on Minnesotans um, in our budget. Um, I guess other provisions within the, the current proposal that have to do with 
um, the mandate, individual mandate, and um, possibly um, if you are uh, out of the insurance market for, what is it, 63 days, and then you come back, then there's some provisions that they can charge you more and um, take into account pre-existing conditions. I think that is um, going <coughs> to affect a large number of Minnesotans. I mean, I think there's there are many, many people who have some form of pre-existing condition that, you know, if, if the rates are um, allowed to be a lot higher um, to take that into consideration, I think that would have a significant impact on Minnesotans. I could go on and there's a lot of a lot of impacts I think that we need to anticipate and have the discussion about um, what do we want um, our Minnesota um, health, how do we want to keep uh, Minnesota, as Senator Franson said, tops in the nation in terms of health care, health healthcare access, um, health insurance uh, coverage. I think we need to have that discussion. Um, it's hard to tell what is going to move forward in the Senate and how they're going to compromise um, on a final bill, but I think we need to have the discussion soon about, about these things. I'll just add, um, Health and Human Services is a very, it's a big beast, um, and a lot of it is transfers from the federal government, as you know, and Minnesota just basically um, pushes that funding out to, to the local level um, through our counties and cities and so forth. Uh, a lot of that funding is in question right now with uh, the, the, the talks about um, eliminating Obamacare and replacing it with something else. Uh, big one is Medicaid. Uh, Minnesota was one of the states that opted to expand Medicaid and if that funding is going to go away from the federal level it, it will mean um, that we will have to pick up that tab or decide to roll back what we expanded uh, which has again serious repercussions to Minnesotans. Uh, a lot of those um, uh, transfers also um, are, are contingent um, in Minnesota. We have a lot of the things in this particular bill we just voted on are contingent upon some federal transfers for other areas which are in question and sometimes we, we add that to the savings or, or the, the, the dollar amount of the bill. Um, but I had a hard time voting for this Health and Human Services bill because a lot of it um, basically relied on something that wasn't confirmed from the federal government and I, we, we have to make our accounting work. Um, if you're a business person you, you can't just say um, we're going to have these savings without really counting for it. So we, we, we end up doing that in, in the state government. I think that's irresponsible. So I, I can't support things that are, are not um, confirmed money that's actually coming in. Other, other money, we call it new money when we're expecting it to come in. We do that in transportation too. Um, so that's also um, kind of uh, not very um, transparent or very um, uh, honest, frankly, of, of this new money is coming in. Well, we've already we expect that to come into the books anyway every year. So um, some of that is being used as well to talk about how much money we invested in health and human services. The fact of the matter is we, we took money out of health and human services and that's going to cost us along the road. I just don't think we should just spend willy-nilly, but at the same time, this is an area like uh, Senator Wickland said, uh, it, it, we have people who are, are growing, um, are, 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 are retiring, we have higher needs as p the population ages, so it's not just that we're just funding big government, it's the, real, the realistic um, uh, or the reality of our demographics. So we have to figure out how do we contain that, um, getting people healthier, getting them more access, not less, to preventive care and, and so forth. So um, uh, it's unfortunate that we, we, we are, um, at, at one point there was a, a talk about a $400 uh, million dollar cut in health and human services. And I just think that's, again, against our, our Minnesota values as the healthiest state in the nation. We should find ways to be innovative and save money, but not at the expense of, of people. So hopefully we'll be able to come back. This is an area that we, every year, we have to grapple with because we will never have enough money to do everything we need to do. But we need to do it smartly. Uh, and we need to, to learn from businesses of how you do it smartly. Um, one of the bills that I support um, that I've worked on, you mentioned at the beginning, what bills are, have you worked on or in this session? Um, prior authorization, I mentioned it before, it's, it's, it's another way of cost containment for um, prescription drugs uh, that we, we need to, to look into and um, that was not, not included. It was included at one point in, in, in the Health and Human Services Conference Committee and then it was taken out. Uh, but we have to wait, look for ways to, to, to make prescription drugs more affordable, to, to make it fair for, for Minnesotans. And, and the devil's in the detail, so I'm not going to bore you with that, but that's another area that I, I'm going to keep working on, uh, including with you over there, and, and hopefully you'll find compromise on that. <coughs> and <coughs> on that note, what are we doing to, what do we do this session to help reduce healthcare costs? And I guess that's health insurance as well. 
Well, I can uh, talk a little bit about, I guess, about reinsurance. Um, early in the session, we had discussions about uh, what did the health insurance market, um, the individual health insurance market, um, need to be hearing or um, feeling was going to happen by the legislature to sort of stabilize what, or to hopefully stabilize the 2018 um, the market. And um, so early in session, we had discussions about what would facilitate that. Um, we passed the, the reinsurance bill, um, which will provide uh, the opportunity for health insurance companies to know that there will be some relief for um, expensive or patients who have a high um, health care costs. I mean, it only affects um, is it after 50,000 amount of expenses have, have been incurred up to, uh, I don't remember what the cap is, 250,000? 250. 250. Um, and the state will then, within that uh, segment of um, 50,000 to 250,000 of expenses, uh, the state will contribute 80% towards that, which will help the health insurance companies um, be able to stabilize um, and not expend as much um, on, you know, these real high cost patients. Um, I guess the the problem for that or with that for the state is that we had to um, contribute um, over $400 million towards that effort for a very small um, market. Um, that's 5% or so of the, um, the health insurance market. Um, and we don't have any um, we don't have any definitive confirmation from the health insurance companies that it will either stabilize premiums or uh, make the health or the the increases in premiums be more reasonable mm -hmm. compared to last year. Um, so I think that's still that's that's a concern, and hopefully, or we we will be finding out. I don't know. Rates will be released, I suppose, in the summer. Um, for plans for 2018, and, and then we'll be able to see, well, did that um, effort uh, to provide a reinsurance plan um, help to stabilize that market for that segment of the population? Um, if, it, if it does, I mean, that, that's great, and um, I think it's, it's helpful to that segment, but it isn't really an ongoing, uh, we can't continue to devote um, you know, three, four hundred million dollars every biennium to to stabilizing such a small part of the market. So I think we still need to look at other ways to control costs. Uh, and I I don't feel like we we didn't spend as much time on that this session as I I would have hoped. And I hope that we have that discussion, you know, over the interim about ways that we could um, possibly impact that through policy changes um, or um, discussions with the health care providers and um, health insurance plans on ways that we could help control costs and maybe next session we can be addressing that um, and maybe you have other things to talk about that well, we did do mm -hmm. well and that on the reinsurance bill which um, I actually had a bill um, mirrored with Alaska model Alaska is the only state who's actually had a reinsurance approved you need a federal waiver to do um, under the new um, Obamacare law to actually implement reinsurance um, correct me if I'm wrong you're in the industry and in Alaska is the only one who's actually done it um, so I had a bill modeled for that it didn't even get a hearing um, so it was obviously um, there was this one idea that moved forward, and that's the only idea that was discussed. And I had a hard time to um, vote for a bill that um, didn't bring other ideas into play, regardless of party. Um, we actually spent $543 million in the next two um, years on reinsurance. And then, um, if you don't recall, the very first bill we actually passed, Senate File 1, was um, the 25% premium assistance to that same group of people who had the uh, insurance hikes and, and were grappling with um, pain or losing their insurance. And that actually cost $312 million from the state reserves. So remember, we actually had a, a proposed um, or projected $1.65 billion surplus. Um, we ended up tapping to the reserves, even having, even with a surplus. So I, I just couldn't agree with how we were funding that at the end of the day. Um, I was on the conference committee for um, Senate File 1 um, and, and voted for it um, at, at that level. But at the end of the day, um, we're using our state reserves, and it's, it, it, I don't think it's a prudent way to use it when we have a surplus. We, we should keep saving for a rainy day, which will come, and, and not 
not um, keep spending um, so much dollars on, on this particular segment. Uh, frankly, because we don't have the reassurances. None of the plans actually give us reassurance that, that they're actually going to um, contain costs. So we need to do more on that policy level as a state, not just put money um, to, 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 sa to save people's um, uh, you know premiums, but we actually have to find a way to bend that cost curve. And again, I think it's 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 pro programs at, at the local level where we actually do preventive and put more emphasis there. Dental is a big one that that our state is the worst in the nation on dental Medicaid reimbursements. We can actually s save people from being in the emergency room for for a toothache if we actually put some better reimbursement rates. And dentists will actually want to take those patients. So there's a lot we can do at the granular level that um, we we need to support because at the end of the day, we'll save taxpayer dollars. Um, so that's one thing, and, and the question was overall health cost. How do we do? That's what did we do I to mean, <coughs> address those this session? You mentioned prior authorization. I think we did have, a, you know, we had a discussion about it and a hearing on it, but, you know, why, why couldn't that make it into some of our plans? So we could be balancing some of these um, other provisions with um, some cost-saving measures going forward. So. So yeah, so dental is some some of those basic notions, but we can go on. Child care assistance is another that's under Health and Human Services, where we can also uh, get people to work and, and and actually afford health insurance instead of relying on the government um, in in a way. So so there's all these dynamics and to play. So it's just just one solution that's going to help um, health care costs go down. There's a series of of, of uh, of things that we could do to try to bend that cost curve and leverage um, or, or all these levers we can pull at the state level. Um, I think dental is, is a big one that we should start um, talking about and actually funding. All right, I think we have probably time for one more uh, question. So let's do kind of a wrap up question and then I don't know if you guys are going to be around afterwards to kind of chat to people individually. Sure, absolutely. That'd be great too, but um, the last question, what do you think, what unfinished business is there that you'd like to work on next year? So I'll start with Senator Whitler. Okay. Um, well, I think as I mentioned, I think the health care um, healthcare cost um, discussion, I think, will, needs to happen. Um, we did, or the Republican leadership did mm -hmm. announce that we're going to have a, a select, uh, kind of a subcommittee to work on this. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, during the interim, and I'm hoping to work with um, Senator Jensen and some of the other senators on that and come up with, see if we can come up with some ideas that we can move forward um, next session. Um, I, in education, I think that uh, this was the main budget year, so I think looking at policy uh, for the next year, um, I would like to see um, some reforms or changes in the, our um, statewide testing and accountability system. Um, there was a report the legislative auditor came out with that um, said that we're spending a lot of money. Um, the state spends several hundred million dollars on state statewide assessments, but we really don't know, um, well, the impact on all the districts on having to, to give all these tests to students in terms of time and um, time away from the classroom work. Um, so I think we could do more to make sure that our, our testing system is actually uh, helping us in the areas that we want it to and, and knowing how well our students are doing in balance with all the other things that we want our schools to do, which is to help prepare them for being career and college ready and um, developing uh, good social emotional um, learning and, and, and connections to their communities. I think we put a lot of um, a lot of burdens on our schools and, and we need to look at are we spending our resources in the right way. So that would be an area that I'd like to work on. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, healthcare, as we just talked about, is one of them. Uh, transportation, uh, as was mentioned as well, we uh, are shortchanging um, transit funding, so we're going to have to come back and either uh, funded or we're going to have serious reduction to transit next in the next few years because we didn't fund it um, completely to actually function at the capacity that it is today. Uh, so, so those are areas that we need to go back to. Um, education, uh, we at least funded at 2%, but inflation is probably uh, a little bit higher than 2%, so we'll always have to be um, vigilant of that uh, because costs of, of just of doing business as a state of providing education for, for our Minnesotans is, is not um, static either. Uh, so we'll see what the impact of this budget is. Um, the, the districts did want 2% um, at least, so we, we gave them that. 
uh, but there's other areas where we'll have to, to, to be vigilant on what we're going to continue to, 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 to invest in. Um, transportation is something that we'll, we'll have to come back because, um, as I see it, this budget uh, made some progress, but it didn't uh, make enough progress, uh, so we'll have to come back and, and continue to, to have that debate, unfortunately, uh, because it's not the first thing that we hear about from our constituents. I, I want you to, to fund our roads. Um, we hear about more um, immediate um, issues like health care and education, um, those usually take more priority, but but at the same time we know that if we don't invest in transportation, um, it's going to cost more because um, patching that pothole today instead of uh, structurally fixing it um, will cost us more in the long run. So those are issues that, that we'll continue to grapple with as, as it is every, every year and, and find some compromise on. Um, I'll just mention too that there was discussion about the bonding bill having a uh, bonding bill next year that would be 2018 would be I guess the even year of the session be a typical year that we would have a bonding bill so there is discussion about whether um, whether or not we would have um, the opportunity to come back with a bonding uh, bonding bill next year as well so I think we'll see if the capital investment committees um, are active this this summer is kind of their time when they usually go around and visit projects and, and try to get input from communities on what projects are important to them. So I guess we'll, you know, we'll see if that um, starts up and happens. Um, although, you know, we know there are many projects that didn't get funded this year that could be in the queue. So. And if you're interested, I do have a list of, of what we saw at 918 on, on the 25th of May, which was a few hours before we voted on it. Yeah. But here's the list of everything that was funded in the bonding, the bonding bill. Um, and if you're interested, I can, I can leave you a copy for your, for your reading uh, leisure and pleasure. All right. Well, I guess, uh, Jonathan, are you coming back up? Or do you? I, I'm, I'm oh, sorry. You're fubbing in? OK, well, then thank you. Thanks. Well, let's thank Senator Branson. Uh,